Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's podcast, we actually have a star from Canada. But before we talk to our, our real estate superstar, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host. You know him. You love him. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. Learn anything about anything, Investor Ninjas. Dot com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm great. I'm still trying to figure out how far to stand away from the mic. I hope it sounds better. Well, why don't you just get a mic like I have? And then the mic's like over here or get a shotgun mic that just hangs and you could be like, the mic could be right here. It's not I, in the I think I'm going to do that. I think I'm, yeah. I'm going to do it. Keep, but, keep up with the audio files. Is that what they call Audio experts. Yeah, but you know what? Speaking of experts, let's talk to our guest, Sarah Larby, whose goal is to inspire, to inspire young professionals to realize their own property owning dreams when they thought real estate investment was going to be out of reach. She will, she, uh, if you're not familiar with Sarah, she's the host of her own podcast, Where Should I Invest? She interviews fellow real estate investors about their strategies. She also co hosts investor learning sessions through the S.O. Reed Club. Um, she has been featured in the Toronto Star, 1010 News Talk Radio, Canadian Real Estate Wealth Magazine, and is a, an avid speaker. She has a seven-figure investment property portfolio by her early 30s. Take that, Scott Todd. You weren't, you weren't seven figures by your early 30s. No, I wasn't. It's okay. Though. You know what? It's okay because we're still going to be nice to her. Sarah Larby, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And... Uh... Right before this, we were uh, we were talking about how this is one of my uh, my last po podcasts before I take the summer off. So I'm excited to to do it with you guys. Yeah, we're we're so excited to have you. So Sarah, let's just rewind the tape a bit. Um, I imagine you started real estate investing in your in your teens. <laughs> I wish I actually just started in 2013 and uh, and just uh, was really focused and determined and. In October of 2020, I, uh, I left the corporate job world for good. Wow, congratulations. Okay, so before we talk about that exit, where do you play on the Monopoly board? What is your specific real estate investing strategy? Yeah, absolutely. So before I left, because it's changed a little bit since then, but before I left, it was the Burr strategy, as you guys are probably familiar with. Um, it's essentially a, a mix of flipping and holding. And I was able to do that with short-term, mid-term, and long-term rentals. Uh, the short-term and mid-term definitely boosted the cash flow. Uh, but you know, it's essentially the buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. Uh, and then just this year, since I left, I had a little bit more time. I started buying land. Uh, I have uh, actually three pieces of land that I bought. Um, one is actually a, a five acre piece of property on the water. We're going to be building 15 cottages. We're going to make it a resort. Uh, and then the other ones are, are some townhouse builds, uh, that we're doing. So, um, it's, it's changed. It's evolved. Um, I'm excited about this, this new chapter, but, uh, essentially what got me to where I am today was the birth strategy. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? All right. So just uh, for those that don't know, can you walk through the birth strategy? I know you kind of hit the, the words, but kind of walk through those pieces again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, the first step is to buy, um, figure out what the market fundamentals are, find a good area, um, find a house that's under market. Um, buying is definitely a big piece of it um, and building your team so that you can buy right. Renovating, um, you know, when I first started, that's step two. When I first started real estate investing, I didn't do any of that. And um, it, it took a little bit longer for the first couple of years when I realized I could add some renovations to force, force up the appreciation. Um, so that's, you know, doing the right renovations, things that will get the most lift uh, as possible. Uh, rent, um, again, depends if you're doing it short term, mid term, long term. Uh, but, you know, the, the renovated properties usually get uh, higher rents, but I've developed a tenant screening process along the way. Um, I can only speak for Ontario. That's where my properties are. But in Ontario, it's very pro tenant. And, uh, and if you have a bad tenant in your, in your properties, it could take you up to a year to get them out. So definitely good tenant screening was very, very important. Um, 
you know, and then refinancing, understanding, you know, uh, how you're going to pull the money out is, is definitely important. And then repeating, um, you know, figuring out ways that you can scale. Um, I, you know, I, I chose not to go the JV route. I did it, uh, you know, with, with my spouse. Um, and I think having, uh, done that, done it that way, I mean, could I have gotten a lot more properties? Sure. But there's something about the control that I liked. Um, but you know, repeating, utilizing private money and different money sources. Um, so just to recap, you know, buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat is the process. And it allows you to be able to, you know, acquire more properties with, um, some or all of that initial money from the prior one. So when when you going Scott. through and like refinancing, like you know, okay, so you, you know you're, you're you're getting the money in there, you're going to refinance the property, you, you know, are you pulling out eighty um, percent? Are you pulling out seventy percent? And, and then is that the the magic equation to keep it going? Because I would believe obviously that you have to pull out enough to get the next one going too. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I first started, the market wasn't as crazy as it is today, where there's like nothing out there and everybody is fighting for the same properties. Um, when I first started, I was pretty much pulling everything out. Um, now, you know, I will still do it if I can uh, pay back all of my holding costs, rental costs, and at least half of my down payment. So I have 10% in. And then what I'll do is just keep, keep a uh, pulse on the market and, uh, um, you know, appreciation uh, in Ontario just because of the the lack of available properties um, and and all the immigration. We've done well from that that point. Of course, cash flow is always more important, uh, but just keeping a good pulse on the market, you know, allowed me to refinance the rest out within another nine months, twelve months uh, after the first refi. So I think the the days of waiting for that perfect deal to be able to refinance everything back out on the first go. Um, is a little bit harder than it used to be when when I first got into it. Um, it's not impossible, but uh, we're you know right now what we're seeing, they're, we're holding off. Everybody's holding offers, right? Holding offers, and you've got ten offers, and you've got this crazy person that's going to overpay for stuff. So um, you know, off market properties going through wholesalers, all that good stuff. Um, you know, will likely help. And one of the things that um, you know, we've, we've started looking is there's such a thing, um, called, so there's bill 108 in Ontario, which essentially allows for, um, somebody like me to go in and buy a single family property, convert in, into two units, uh, to duplex it, and then actually add an additional dwelling unit in the backyard. And that actually helps with a lot of the refinancing piece and also the cash flow, um, to give that a boost. Interesting. Interesting. Um, you know, I, I found it interesting that you even have a hard time with tenant screening in Ontario. We all know Canadians are way friendlier than Americans. <laughs> so, so, so is the system. Unfortunately, it's not friendlier to landlords. <laughs> it's, but it's not friendlier to landlords. Um, so Sarah, before we get into like the nitty gritty of, of, you know, money sources and, and, um, you know, a case study on, on your latest deal, I wanted to talk a little bit about quitting your job because I can imagine there, there's people, you know, in their 30s right now that have been doing land investing or other types of real estate investing. And they're wondering, you know, how do I know when to quit my job? What was it like quitting your job? Um, for you, what was your experience? Yeah, absolutely. So I was, uh, I don't know if, if uh, people are going to be listening to this or seeing this, but I was just on my dock out here last summer in the middle of COVID. And I was drinking some wine, staring at the water. And I'm like, you know, why am I working crazy hours where I, you know, I started looking at my finances where, you know, I am missing opportunity um, to be able to grow and, and, and acquire and, and do more. Um, but B, you know, when I was looking at like my cash flow and I'm like, I can live off of this, but it doesn't mean I'm going to stop. Um, and I was paying a lot of taxes, <laughs> of course, if the government likes to put your money in your pocket, in their pocket, when you got a T4 or a job income. Um, but it was, it was just literally drinking wine and be like, you know, I'm doing real estate to, to live the lifestyle. I, I can live it now. I might as well just go ahead and, and do it. And yeah, it was in the middle of COVID, but it's the best thing I've ever done. Um, what I did do though, is, uh, I gave myself, uh, this was probably back in, May, June, May and June that I decided. Um, and then I ended up leaving in October. So I was 
I called my mortgage broker and I'm like, hey, you know, as soon as I don't have a, another full time job or a T4 income, which is what we we call, um, you know, regular job incomes here in Canada, I'm not going to be able to qualify for much more. And, you know, obviously there's always commercial properties, but from a residential standpoint. So we refinanced the portfolio, unlocked equity. I was looking, I'm like, okay, well, who knows what's going to happen with COVID. But if there's a downside, you know, I've got, I've got a buffer. If there's an upside, that's fine too. Um, and then I, I give um, my employer uh, a long notice um, I think I told him in June or July as well. Uh, and then we told the company and it was August. So um, they had from from that point on, uh, I, I helped backfill my role. And then October 1st was uh, the retirement day. Um, and and here's the thing is, as a real estate investor, do I want to stop and do nothing and, and literally just let my brain go to mush? No, like I'm going to keep doing stuff, but it's just a, an ability for me to say if I want to work five or 10 hours, if I want to be at the cottage all summer, have people come and visit me, I can. Um, and it's uh, it's definitely a lifestyle change, but it wasn't. It wasn't like a decision where like I'm like I'm going to do it today or I'm, I've decided today and tomorrow I quit. Like there was definitely some planning involved. Any any uh, hazing from the parents? My parents have always been very supportive, um, which is nice. Um, they were actually like encouraging me to do it. Um, my spouse was encouraging me to do it, and um, you know I think it, part of it is they're, they're entrepreneurs. So when I'm like we're going to go buy some real estate, they're like, hey, that's really cool. You know, um, my dad wants to now come in on some deals. So does my you know my mom. So like the, the, that's the lucky thing is that they've never said, hey, you're crazy. Um, they were always like, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever makes sense. Like they don't necessarily fully understand it. Um, but I think that they trust me enough with, you know, wh where I want to go to just be supportive. And, and that's, um, that's very helpful for sure. No, I, I love that. Scott, Scott Todd, how, how lucky is that to have a supportive parent, you know, in your corner? Because oftentimes you'll hear that, you know, security, security, get a good job, get a good education, and then they, they're they not supportive because out of fear. It's not out of lack of love. It's out of fear. And yet, you know, coming from our backgrounds, I know you, me, we are supporting our kids to do what Sarah's doing. Sarah's probably going to do that with her children. Um, but it, it is a mindset shift, right? Yeah, and I think that one of the things that's um, cha obviously challenging is um, – it is challenging to put your brain around not having to go to a corporate gig or your, your, your normal routine, right? And Mark, we see this, we see this in coaching students. We see this, um, where, you know, they, they're, they're successful in getting their business to where they can quit their jobs. And then, you know, what happens is the survivor's guilt. I call it survivor's guilt kicks in. And it's, you know, it's that feeling like, Oh my gosh. Um, I should be working a full-time job right now. And so what we do is we start to build our own businesses. Like I've got to keep doing this 40 hours a week. And it, it takes it. Sometimes it takes someone to like shock you and go, why? And it's, it's almost what Sarah was saying is I've been doing this to create a lifestyle for myself. Why do I now have to keep working 40 hours a week? Oh, I don't. Oh, and then you got to give yourself permission to kind of chill. So did you struggle with that at all? I mean, you know, are your friends like, hey, you know, we're working 40, 50 hours a week while you're at the lake house doing, you know, multi-million dollar deals working two hours a week? I think part of it is I've surrounded myself with other like-minded people probably in the last four or five years and, and really networked and, and found people that I could relate to that relating to me. And, and I was actually like in my close group of friends, the last person still working nine to five. Now, not that my friends don't work like, you know, one's a realtor, but most of them are investors. Um, and so it was actually me that had the, the horrible schedule. Now we're doing brunch on like a random Monday <laughs> in the middle of the day. Um, you know, do I still have some friends from like high school, university that are, are working, you know, the nine to five? Absolutely. But, um, you know, sometimes it's surrounding yourself with like-minded people and you kind of push each other to, to achieve more and to do more. And um, it's actually pretty cool because I think there's three of us, uh, that retired uh, throughout COVID and we're going to have a, when things reopen, because things are still closed right now in Ontario, but when things were re going to reopen, we were actually talking this weekend about 
having a joint retirement party. One retired from being a lawyer, corporate lawyer. Uh, one was doing some like diagnostics and imaging stuff in the hospital. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, I think part of it is surround yourself with people that are going to push you to do more and, and be better. And, um, and then it doesn't feel as crazy and out there. Uh, you're like, you know, the, the crazy thing was I was still holding a, a full-time job and I'm like, all of them, they get to hang out, they get to do all these things. <laughs> so, so here I might as well catch up here. Right. So. No, I, I love that. And it's, it's so funny because you, I love that Jim Rohn quote, you're the average of the five people you hang out with the most. Mm -hmm, right. So sir, let's, let's take a look at your first deal and let's use that as a case study. Walk us through it. My very first one, I did not know anything. So I thought we had to save, well, we saved the 20% down. So I ended up having two jobs um, and put as much as I can into this um, this rental property. It was a $139,000 house from the 1850s. Somehow it's still sta standing today. And Matt, my boyfriend, um, you know, he's he's a police officer, so he sees the worst of the worst. So he didn't really want to do real estate to begin with from the tenant perspective to deal with the nightmares that we hear all the time, right, on, on the news and whatnot. Um, so he was, he, you know, he came around and he's, he's come around, but it took a couple of years to convince him like, Hey, I want to do this. Like, this is how we're going to be wealthy and we're going to change our lives and be able to like do the things that we want to do without being stuck. Um, and so the first one, his sister needed a place to live closer to her daughter's school. And she ended up being her tenant. We probably undercharged her. Had I screened her and my, my criteria today, I would have never rented to her. Um, their family, they're cool, but like, you know, they say they'll rent a family for a certain reason. So that they, she, uh, she definitely, you know, put, put us through a lot of things that, that, you know, as a landlord, you can expect, right. Uh, no payment of rent, uh, delays, um, you know, the house being trashed and I'm, I'm open to it. I mean, they know what they did, but we're cool now, <laughs> but it helps build, um, you know, like gets rid of the fear. And I think part of the fear is a lot of the unknown. And when it happens, you you kind of just maneuver through it, but, um, you know, we didn't lose money on it. Like we, you know, that house probably today from 2013 for 130,000 is, is worth, it's in a really good area, right? We bought the ugliest street in a really, really good area, probably worth about 400 grand. Um, and it's, it's so small, but in the grand scheme of things, I mean, we've learned a lot that's where you got to start. Um, and, uh, and we had to renovate it like small renos the first time, like very, very basic. And then we had to renovate it the second time, but ultimately like we did well on it. It got us into the game and, uh, you know, it, uh, it helped build processes and procedures along the way as well. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? Look, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, you just got to do it, right? Like you just got to start down the process and the first deal is never perfect. It's never beautiful. Uh, the most important thing is you got the first deal done and then you can move on to the second one. And I think that's where a lot of people stop. I mean, Mark, um, it's funny. The, I was thinking today because I was, I was down in this neighborhood where my mom lives and I was driving the, sh the street and out of a, out of nowhere, this memory hit me. I had forgotten all about this until I saw this house. It was in the neighborhood. And the thing about this house was that I saw it and I'm like, Oh my gosh. I can't, I remember that now. And what happened was it was, it was like my first deal. I had, I had watched the Carlton Sheets type of infomercials and I went out and I found this, this ugly house, you know, like the, the driving for dollars type of a thing. I find this house and I talk to the owner, the house is vacant and he's like, yeah, I'll sell you, I'll sell the property and I'll sell it to you for, I, I think that the number was around like, uh, 60,000, somewhere in that range. Well, I didn't sign a, I didn't sign a contract or anything. I didn't know. Like, I just, I'm like, oh, okay, I'll, I think I'll pay you 60. The problem was I didn't have 60. I didn't even have like $3,000. I had no money and I'm doing the whole Carlton sheets, like no money down type of a thing. So I get on the phone and I find another uh, real estate investor in the market and he's, he, he's like, I want to see the house. So he meets me at the house. I still have the key. I walk into the house. He's like, uh, how much do you have this thing for? I'm like 60. And he goes, 60? I'll give you 65, five for it. I'm like, bam, done. Let's do it. So I sign up the contract with the guy and he's like, okay, my title company is going to call you. So the title company calls me and they're like, Hey, um, I see that, you know, you're selling the house for 60. Yep. But your name's not on the, on the, you know, county records. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
seller's going to sell it to me for 60,000. And, and they're like, okay, you got the contract. And I'm like, no. And they're like, you don't have a contract. I'm like, well, he told me, he told me like he'd sell it to me for 60. And I'm going to sell it to this guy for 65. Well, to make a long story short, like, uh, I didn't really have a deal, right? Like, and so the the other realtor, he was or the other uh, investor, he was kind of cool about it, but at the same time, he was agitated because I wasted his time. Uh, the, but the people ended up selling it because once they got wind that I was going to sell it to somebody else for sixty five, their price went up, and I kind of got cut out of the deal there. But see, that's the thing: is the first deal is ugly. I got scared and I retracted and hid for a little while. But that's the thing is if you keep coming back to it, you won't fail. You just got to keep coming back, get over the fear and keep going, even when it's ugly and messy and all of this other stuff. Yeah, it's really, really inspiring uh, story as, as far as, you know, the lesson being that the worst case scenario is you're learning a great lesson yeah. and the next one's going to be easier. But Sarah, you said something really interesting to me. I put 20% down, which I didn't need to do, or I saved for 20% down, which I didn't need to do. If we could rewind the tape, walk us through all the things that you would now do differently than you did on that first deal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in Canada, you're able to utilize the equity in other properties in order to um, unlock that money to buy a down payment. So as an investment property, you still have to put 20 percent down. But what we've been able to do is when we had equity in other properties, you know, as as we learned along the way, rather than having to save all of that money for that next one, because our, our properties are at 65 grand. I mean, right now we're, you know, we're looking at like on on a market that you know we're we're trying to burn for five hundred thousand dollar properties. Um, you know, 20% down is a lot to save. And so um, you know, with with this market specifically, like we have um, equity buildup uh, on our side more so than maybe some places in the U.S. where you're you're buying only for cash flow and the appreciation is is minimal. Of course, we want to buy for cash flow. Our cash flow likely in this market won't be as good as as some some places in the U.S. Um, but the appreciation has has um, helped us. Um, and if you if you find a, a good mortgage broker that can help you, you can unlock that equity. And you can then reutilize, um, to, you know, the the cash towards your next down payment, and that's what a lot of us are, are doing here. Um, doesn't work everywhere in Canada, um, but uh, you know, there are some markets that has you know, potential for that. Anything else you would change? Oh yeah, tons, tons of stuff. I mean, you, you know, you learn along the way. And you're like, I would change this. I would change that. I mean, from a financing standpoint, um, you know, we we definitely should have worked with a mortgage broker from the beginning, other than going to the bank, um, because they're all the lenders have different criteria. Um, and you know, when we bought our second one or third one, like they wanted like more down payment, like they wanted like 25 percent down. Then they the other one they wanted 35 percent down, and it was just the wrong bank to work with at that point in time. Um, you know, had I known, I would have also put, um, you know, properties in my name only, and then some in, in Matt's name only, and then we would have been able to acquire more with better lenders. Um, you know, I would have figured out my my contractors off the bat. I've had, you know, horror stories with contractors. I had to fire some. They were good at one job. They got into drugs on the next one. I mean, you know, the, the thing is, like, you build your team over time. And, um, you know, had I known if I if I knew what I what I know now, if I knew that back then, I would have definitely probably scaled faster. But I, I enjoy the mistakes in the sense that like I'm like, okay, I learned from this. Like you don't ever want to be somebody that's been successful and be like, everything's been a piece of cake. Like if you haven't, you know, lost something or made a mistake at something, you're not learning from anything. And so um, you know, I I wouldn't hire a coach, for example, that has made no mistakes whatsoever and has, you know, made everything perfect. Um, I don't think you can really learn from that. So is that, is that a shot at Scott Todd? No, <laughs> not at all. Hey, but, six, baby. you know, but I, I think I probably, I could have hired a coach back then to, to help me build my team faster. I have a great team now. Um, and I have great contractors now, but you know that there's, there's, it takes time to do that stuff. And, um, and now I even have a coach to help me with the whole development stuff that I hired recently to just get me to that next level. Um, so I think that piece is important, you know, definitely like find a coach that's doing what you want to do. That's hopefully still doing it. 
Um, you know, you don't want them to have done it like 10 years ago because the markets change and everything changes so much. Um, you know, but I, I, I likely would have, you know, scaled faster, um, better if I had uh, somebody that helped me put all the pieces together from early on. I love it. I love it. Scott Todd, you do make mistakes, right? Oh, yeah. I, mean, I, I, just don't, I just don't see them. Well, you know, when you have people around you that cover it up and filter, you know, ABAs, they kind of make it look seamless, right? That's right. That's right. So, Sarah, we're at that point now in the podcast where we're going to ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, maybe a book, something else actionable for the Art of Passive Income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What do you got? I mean, I'm a co-founder of therightclub.com. We provide real estate investing education. It's free. Um, go on therightclub.com. It's the and then R-E-I-T-E club.com. They can go to the forums. They can go to the marketplace. You can build your team that way. There's tons of great things. Um, so I would say that. And then, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Like podcasts are how I really learned along the way as well. So you guys are, you know, uh, providing this content out there. A lot of it can be free. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Um, educate yourself and then just make sure that you take action. And like the perfect deal is not perfect on purchase. Like you can make it really awesome along the way. Um, but if you're just waiting for that perfect deal to, to fall on your lap on your first go around, you know, you're gonna be waiting for a long time because you're competing against a lot of people that have a lot of experience that can act a lot faster. So get some like decent deals, make them great and uh, and keep going. I love it. I love it. Before we get to Scott Todd's tip of the week, I have to give a shout out to our sponsor, which is Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life. Go up that mountain of land investing with Scott Todd, whom is not perfect, as your Sherpa. But he's going to take you up there quickly, safely, and efficiently. And he's done it thousands of times. Not hundreds of times. Not a couple times. Thousands of times. And uh, oh, by the way, the tuition ain't going to cost you nothing. We guarantee it. We're going to promise the guarantee in writing that you will make back that flight school tuition 180 days or less. Just show us your work. You're going to make that back in terms or cash deals. Your next step, get on a call, learn more, go to landgeek.com forward slash training, thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Scott Todd, what is your tip of the week? Mark, you know, um, one of the things that people do is they start off with, for their email marketing, they'll start off with like MailChimp or maybe graduate to AWeber or uh, ConvertKit or something else. But what happens is you have to pay per user that you have, right? Like pay per user. Well, if you're just starting out, I mean, if I were starting out, this is what I would do. I would change, but check out sendfox.com. Sendfox.com and uh, you pay... Uh, I don't know, they have a free plan, but then after a thousand people, you can upgrade to, uh, to 5,000 people for a whopping $49 one time fee. And then, um, after that, as you grow, it's like a, a nominal $18 a month for unlimited people. So pretty cool. That is really cool. Interesting. What's the catch? Oh, I know what the catch is they're not going to make any money and then they're going to go out of business. No, they charge you. Their catch is that your email list is going to grow, and then you get to eighteen uh, five thousand and one people. Well, then you're at eighteen dollars a month. No catch. They got a revenue model behind it. All right, Sarah, you like that? Sounds good to me. All right, there you go. All right, fine. I'm not going to rip on your tip of the week, Scott Todd. Yeah. No. Anyways, you guys have good tips, but my tip is the best one because it's the one that's going to really help you go deep on the burr method. It's not going to keep you cool. It's going to put you in the blanket of real wealth. So learn more, go to sarahlarby.com. I have a link to it, sarahlarby.com, as well as Sarah's tip of the week and Scott's tip of the week will be in the show notes. Um, Sarah Larby, are we good? Thanks very much, Mark and Scott, for having me on. You guys are great hosts. Really had fun with you guys today. Great. Well, thanks for being on, even though you're on, at the lake house, um, probably getting ready to crack open a, a bottle of Chardonnay. We're going to do a little boat ride after this. <laughs> you're, you're standing in between my boat ride. <laughs> All right. Just well, kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> we're going to wrap it up. Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. All right. I want to thank the listeners. Just remind them the only way, the only way we're going to quality of guests like a Sarah Larby from SarahLarby.com 
is if you do us three favors, you got to follow us. You got to rate us. You got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review. Support at melangeek.com. We're going to send for free the $97 wholetailing course, how to double your money 30 days or less. All right, let's do this. One, two, three. Let's freedom ring. All right. Go enjoy that boat ride, Sarah. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Start your journey at www.thelandgeek.com and www.scotttaub.net. Rate and review the podcast and email support at thelandgeek.com. Your screenshot for a free passive income launch kit.